The outline of the presentation uh, will be a brief overview of the project and the bridge type investigations that uh, was uh, were conducted for the best type of bridge structure for this particular project site. And after that, uh, I will go a little bit uh, more in detail the practical uh, considerations of structural analysis of curved girder bridges. And uh, after that, I'll briefly look at uh, one of the flyover ramps, which is ramp B67, which is the uh, ramp with the most uh, curvature. And uh, after that, uh, I will uh, go into my civil analyses that uh, were conducted to uh, calculate the lateral response of the uh, overall structure, uh, including the uh, pier stiffnesses and uh, soil uh, spring representation for this structure soil interaction. And then a, a brief discussion of results. The, the project is located approximately 15 miles northwest of downtown Chicago in DuPage County, just west of O'Hare International Airport. Here, the Illinois 390 Expressway, which is also known as Algin O'Hare Expressway, uh, connects to the Illinois 490 Expressway, which is uh, also uh, known as the Western O'Hare Western Access Expressway. And uh, and this area is uh, this very uh, new and uh, and several new ramps will be built in addition to the ramps uh, of uh, for this entire uh, section here. And those ramps will eventually carry the uh, traffic and provide access to O'Hare Airport to a new terminal building that will be built on the west side of the airport. This is the plan view of the these expressways. Now the it's tilted 90 degrees, so north is going from left to right. So this is the I-490 going south to north, and the uh, Algin O'Hare Expressway Illinois 390 going west to east. And these are the four ramps. I will be. Uh, discussing with you. As you can see from this uh, picture, the ramps go over one arterial roadway, which is not shown here, but it's right here, it's called York Road, and two uh, railroad lines, Canadian Pacific Railway and Union Pacific Railroad. And these uh, railroads uh, become a major consideration on the uh, type of structure. For the bridge type investigation, five girder systems were considered at, at a typical 
steel plate girder, steel top girder, concrete U girder, concrete segmental, and hybrid part steel part concrete uh, structure. And, and typical ramp is a multi-span structure and uh, with the railroad right in the middle and the York Road on, on the second span here. Erection and construction challenges played an important role in determining the, the, the most suitable uh, bridge type for, at this site. As I mentioned previously, two air, uh, railroads, they are both class one uh, railroads with uh, 40 plus trains per day uh, and uh, this poses a, 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 some construction issues that needs to be considered at the early stages of the project. Mainly all work must stop when train passes through within 25 feet each side of track. So, um, and uh, this this is something very significant because of the erection and uh, uh, transport, all kind of construction related. And in addition to that, the uh, this boom heights of the cranes are limited due to the uh, air space requirements. And uh, and this uh, what keeps the booms uh, much uh, like half the normal booms, and uh, in addition to that, the site is very congested. There there is not enough space for crane locations, and uh, girder storage areas are very limited, and mo most the structures. Uh, require some sh shoring towers for stability during construction and then those shoring towers needs to be minimum 15 feet clear of active tracks on each side. And uh, in addition to that, girder weight and length limitations for erection and transportation. Here is an uh, example of, uh, in a schematic manner, how these would work. There's very limited space in these rail yards. They, there are like two, three tracks on each side. And uh, so this it had to be considered in detail for each uh, bridge type under consideration. For example, one typical example here for each uh, bridge type uh, after the preliminary uh, design, uh, crane locations, how the uh, tracks coming in with the girders, how is it going to be lifted up from the track and uh, erected. So these were all considered in detail. This is a typical um, picture taken from a different project that shows a uh, plate girder erection. On As you could notice here, it, the girders are erected usually from the outside towards the inside. And uh, the other thing is the uh, usually you, you, you want to put the uh, fix pier the first, start uh, erect, erecting the girders from fixed pier 
towards the expansion peers that uh, minimizes the uh, the cross frame fit uh, issues. So after extensive research into design, fabrication, and erection consideration, the still uh, curved girder was found to be the best option. Here's the picture of uh, a plate girder being erected here. Some shoring is required because these girders, due to, due to curvature, tend to tip over. However, uh, uh, the, the the owner, in this case the Illinois Tollway, uh, requested the, uh, the further investigations conduct uh, to be conducted for concrete u girder option, and uh, and uh, here we see a u girder is a concrete very heavy sections and uh, it's harder to uh, erect and uh, basically um, this is also very new in uh, Illinois uh, it's, it has been successfully used uh, in uh, Colorado, Florida and uh, a couple other Washington State and uh, Texas uh, for this type of ramps, uh, but in Illinois uh, they, they they are not uh, here. It's not here yet. So the uh, so the ex Illinois precasters need to tool up their operations to uh, fabricate this type of girders, and it requires time and investment. And in addition to that, due to the uh, weight of these sections, we, uh, new high capacity cranes transport vehicles required and uh, non-standard shoring towers uh, with straddle bands, strong bags to, uh, needed to support uh, the splice points because these girders come in pieces and they are spliced in, in field basically a, a piece of the uh, section is completed by a uh, infield pour and, and then they are post tension so requires special contractors and high quality control so based on all these things its detailed investigation was uh, conducted and then it, it was uh, found too risky for a project schedule with many uh, many uh, construction industry challenges need to be overcome in a short duration of time. So the final decision was a steel plate girder bridge. Basically uh, the behavior of steel girder bridges, there are two major categories of uh, base. primary bending is due to the vertical shear, vertical moment and vertical deflections as experienced by all, all bridges. And uh, in addition to that, the curved steel girder bridges experience uh, it, torsional stresses which result in warping and uh, bending of uh, fl flanges of the plate girders and, uh, and skew effects also play a role of course skew effects are also part of the straight bridges but uh, it, the curved bridges can also have skew supports, so that also needs to be considered in design. Typical curved girder framing. 
this one with two girders. As you would notice that the center of, center of gravity of the girder is offset from the support line connecting two ends of the girder. This creates a, a torsional force that needs to be resisted by the girder. Since uh, plate girders have very uh, small torsional stiffness, the, the, the girder needs to deform excessively to resist these torsional forces. That's, that's shown here. And often this, uh, this distortion is unacceptable and uh, in many cases the section will reduce its load carrying capacity and sometimes it will buckle. And to stabilize the system, basically diaphragms or cross frame members are utilized. These connect the adjacent girders so to prevent the girder rotation. In that regard, the diaphragms and cross frames become a primary member of the system. So the to look into what is happening with the horizontal curvature effects, this let's consider a semicircular band section. And if we pull this section from both ends with a force T, then there needs to be a, a reaction in the inside to have equilibrium in the vertical direction here. So there has to be some uh, some reaction. So, um, so then f from equilibrium we can say that uh, T will be equal to Q times R. So then if we know T we can calculate the R. This, this is the radial reaction that would be needed to equilibrate this system. Now, uh, if you look at a, uh, the, this two girder system, now the top top flange will be in in a positive moment region. It will be in compression, and the bottom flange will be in tension. So the top flange H1, the skew in this case, there will be the resultant of the skew, which will be equal to Q times the this cross frame spacing H1, pulling the top girder towards the center of the curve. And on the contrary, the, the bottom flange will experience tension, so that there has to be a force H1 equal to a top flange reaction, pushing it out away from the center of the circle. So, th in that manner, then it could be shown that uh, the uh, and if you take the equilibrium of these horizontal uh, a forces H1 and H2 on the other side, you you can uh, calculate the a relationship between the, the, the horizontal force and uh, this vertical shear that is in addition to the other forces. This is the curvature effect, and this this is uh, usually known as uh, V load. And so, 
in the VLOAD method, we, the, we analyze each girdle independently for the vertical loads and calculate the primary moments. And using the uh, equation we just looked at, we, we can calculate the, these fictitious V loads that would have to be developed within the system for equilibrium. And, the, and adding these two effects gives the final results. So it's a two-step process. And that So now, what happens with the uh, diaphragms in place? So, the diaphragms basically then from the V-load uh, uh, equation, we can say that uh, uh, the diaphragm force will be MD over HR. And, uh, and as we discussed uh, uh, in the previous slide, the top flange will be pushed inside and the bottom flange pushed outside in the positive moment region. So it, it, it creates a warping of the section. Here it shows an ex exaggerated picture of the warping. So basically what it is is that we have the radial forces on the flanges of the girder if you look at just one girder, let's, if, if you look at the bottom girder, for example, we have that uh, radial forces due to curvature. And, and then each cross frame acts as a support. So basically, the flange is a continuous beam sitting on its edge, subject to this uniform load of uh, Q due to curvature. So then the flange bends in its, it, it, its in, uh, own plane, uh, thus uh, creating a flange bending, which is called lat lateral flange bending. And they are also uh, termed warping normal. And these, this lateral flange bending will create normal stresses, compression on one side of the flange and t tension on the other side. And these are known as warping normal stress. Since the, these lateral uh, forces are directly proportional to the bending moment, so the radial component of uh, flange forces are uh, all proportional to the bending moments and then they follow the same shape of the bending moment diagram. So previously we said we add the primary moments and secondary moments due to curvature. It's a two-step process to get the final uh, loading on the girder and from that we can calculate the stresses, bending stresses. In addition to that, due to the uh, these uh, uh, lateral loading on this continuous uh, multi girder flange, uh, we can also calculate the the stress, normal stress, the uh, stresses due to the uh, curvature effects. It, it's simple uh, equation which, which is commonly used is this equation here, m d square divided by 10 r h. Here the m is the lateral flange bending moment, m is the primary bending moment, and D is the cross frame spacing, radius of curvature, and depth of the girder. So going, uh, uh, come back uh, to the previous slide here. The point is that 
the, from this lateral moment, we can calculate the warping normal stresses by dividing the moment by the section uh, modulus of the flange. So, so with that, uh, uh, it, now I'm going to look at the analysis of curved uh, girder bridges. They're basically, we are all familiar with these. The line girder methods, they are commonly used for uh, bridge girders. If it's a straight uh, bridge, uh, line girder methods are used and uh, you can design everything with these methods and uh, uh, and y using the V-load method you can add the curvature effects with the line girder method uh, as we uh, discussed previously and then we can use the approximate methods for the flange bending uh, st n warping normal stresses and then with that it is one way of doing it. That's the easiest way uh, but this is more, uh, the, the disadvantage of this method is that you still don't uh, consider the interaction between girders. In order to consider the interaction, we need to go to a 2D uh, grid or 2D free, uh, frame element uh, methods. Here, in these methods, the, all the girders and the cross frames modeled by line elements. They are basically beam elements and then the loads are analyzed and the moments and reactions are uh, computed. And here the vertical depth of the structure is not considered. And again here the approximate methods are used for the lateral flange bending due to curvature effects. And these uh, lateral uh, approximate methods can also be used to include uh, stresses due to uh, wind loading, for example, other lateral uh, forces. And three-dimensional uh, uh, frame methods. These use three-dimensional beam elements, the depth of the uh, structure is considered, cross frames, diaphragms are also modeled by equivalent beam elements. So that is, uh, again, these uh, elements do not model the warping of the cross sections. So again, at the end, you need to use that approximate method to calculate the warping normal stress. One improvement to this is this uh, thin walled open section 3D uh, frame methods. Here, an additional degree of freedom is added. Uh, that's a warping degree of freedom that calculates the, st the stiffness of the uh, girder due to warping. Basically, it's related to the section modulus of the uh, flanges. And these, uh, mo these frame models are uh, capable of matching uh, more rigorous 3D finite element analysis quite closely and they're uh, quite uh, useful. They, they, however, there are some issues with uh, uh, composite sections where these uh, beam elements are uh, connected to uh, deck with rigid links that creates some uh, problems, so careful modeling is required. Going uh, and plate and eccentric beam methods. Here, the, the deck is modeled by uh, plate or shell elements, and then the girders are modeled by 3D frame elements and they are rigidly linked. So this model represents the, uh, the depth of the structure. And uh, 
as we will discuss shortly, these uh, have a little bit better response when a skew uh, is considered in addition to the radial curvature of the system. 3D finite element analysis methods. Here the, the structure is modeled fully in three dimensions and uh, usually the, 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 the flanges are modeled using beam, shell, even solid type elements depending on the results uh, being uh, seeked. And the girder webs are usually modeled using plate, shell, or solid elements. So they, this is a very, very uh, sophisticated model. And cross frames are modeled by beam or truss elements. And uh, I guess the point is that it is, of course, going back to 3D finite element methods is that this is a very time-consuming, very rigorous thing. And obviously, with this kind of sophistication, there is no limit how good of a model you can de develop and uh, very accurate analysis could be achieved. But is it worth it? I'm, all that effort, I, g I guess the limit here is the time and the schedule. These things are uh, usually done as a final check because uh, most projects you don't have enough time to go through this kind of thing and every time a, this, it, you cannot really iterate on the s section uh, and every time you do that it will change. So, uh, so it is very important to uh, select the right analysis procedure for a given bridge. Here I, in, 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 with, uh, I found some inf uh, important information in the uh, NCHRP report 12-79. Here they investigated all hundreds of uh, bridges in the United States and elsewhere and then they did uh, run a parametric study and identified the, some common parameters of these bridges and then they call it re, uh, key bridge response indices. One in this, in this is the skew index, which is the width of the bridge times the skew divided the span length. So that gives you some idea of how bad the skew is. The other in index is the uh, connectivity index, I see. This given by this equation and is inversely related to the radius of the curve and uh, number of cross frames in a span and a constant m. m is one for a single span and two for a cross frame. So this, in this parenthesis, I have like if the uh, skew index is more than 0 0.3, that creates some problems, and we'll see in a second. Uh, in the, and similarly, the uh, connectivity index, if it's larger than one, requires special uh, consideration. And in addition to those, uh, we have a torsion index girder length index and global second order amplification index. These are all, in, uh, it looks like I'm running a little bit behind schedule, so I, I will skip these things. For uh, our sample bridge, there is no skew. It is uh, radially uh, supported. And I calculated using this formula, the connectivity index is 0 0.76. And here again in this reference uh, investigation report, they give which kind of analysis would be the uh, most applicable. Uh, here C is for a, a curved system, S for a straight system. And 
uh, 2D P1 is a 2D grid model of MDX program. P2 is a, a plate and eccentric beam model. We just looked briefly. Uh, it's a LARSA program. And 1D is the learn, uh, line girder analysis. So for, uh, by just looking at this and calculating these two indexes, the number one and number two, you can quickly see that what type of analysis would give you good results. Here, the bending is an a, ranked A for both P1 and P2, and vertical displacements ranked A. So that is uh, it's a very uh, good uh, information just to determine the type of level of uh, sophistication is needed for a particular uh, bridge, curve, curve bridge. Here, for example, if the connectivity uh, index is more than one, then these, uh, these methods start uh, going, you know, accumulating error. So, in fact, the vertical displacements, they, they received an F. So, they lose their accuracy quickly if the... Uh, so, if you look back here, they, it is directly related to the curvature and the number of cross frames. So, also, by calculating this index, looking at the radius, you can determine how many cross frames you would need at each span, so that will give you an idea of the cross frame spacing. And similarly, if you have skew, in this case we don't have skew, but if you have skew, you can look at these cases with uh, curved and skewed bridge, and then what kind of grades. If you cannot find anything in this tab table that would work for your grid structure, then you, that means you need a real sophisticated uh, analysis, probably a 3D model. Okay, very briefly, I want to mention the cross-frame detailing considerations. Basically, the curved girders uh, will be uh, plump only in one load condition. So then uh, for so the fabricator must uh, fabricate the cross frames to fit in the field and uh, this is dictated by the, the girder erection loads and construction methods. So that the fabricator needs to work closely with the erector uh, to figure out how he's going to do it, so that based on that he will detail the cross frame so that everything fits in the field. So, but, uh, basically there are three types of uh, uh, detailing, which one is a no load fit detailing, basically assume that the girders will be assembled in the field under no load c condition, and that is possible if you provide uh, sufficient number of uh, uh, temporary supports in the field. You can put these girders on these supports so they don't experience any significant uh, bending. So then everything will fit nicely. And uh, other thing is that if you don't want to use any uh, temporary uh, supports, then you can detail it under still dead load only. So this still dead load fit is basically if you assemble, you know, erect the girders without any temporary supports. And the, 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 the total dead load fit detailing is usually used when uh, none of these two things work, then you'll have to do that. But what will not work? What doesn't work is that when you have a skew and a curve at the same time, Usually, then you you will you will have some uh, girder layover at supports. But what girder layover is that the it's the twist. The girder will be twisted during erection, and th that 
twist sometimes is significant because your bearings have uh, limited rotation capacity. So if it uh, if it uh, twisted, then you exceed the capacity of your bearing. So to avoid that, you do detail it for the total load. However, the problem with these uh, uh, second and third method is that usually you would have to f apply force in the field for the cross frames to uh, fit. And, uh, and these forces are usually additive to the actual dead loads, so it increases the stresses in the girders. That needs to sometimes become a, a, a design uh, it could be significant. And uh, however, there is also this uh, uh, NCHRP report 12-79 uh, recommends that for radially supported uh, girders systems, the no load fit detailing is the best approach. And uh, and uh, if there is a uh, layover in the middle of the span, then instead of using these other two methods, uh, additional cross frames could be employed to stiffen the girder so that the girder layover is uh, minimal, minimized. And of course, you can always put a, uh, a temporary support. So that's the that's the recommendation of the report. Okay, uh, now I'm running a real a little bit short on time, so I'll quickly go on the flyover ramp 67. Here is the bridge. It is a five-span bridge going over the railroads, and uh, here I guess the biggest. I'll go quickly. Design specification based on the Ashto. LRFT and uh, uh, in addition to HL93 load, they also have a special truck called Illinois 120 truck. So the bridge is designed using both of these trucks and this truck is a little bit heavier with more axles and, uh, and this is the cross section. Six girders are required because one of the requirements here is the future decking. So the agency wants to do the deck replacement, remove one half of the deck. So for the remaining half to be stable, you need to have, uh, they want to have minimum three girders. So that adds up to six girders. And the, the, the piers here, the single column, piers supported on single caissons used. The, here, uh, the, this is the, uh, min, uh, to minimize the impact on railroad operations. And the, uh, these caissons could be, one caisson could be built, uh, constructed uh, in a day or two, or not a day, two or three days. Three days is the maximum. So this is very quick. Uh, very efficient system. However, when you have a single uh, uh, column, single case on uh, foundation, uh, these things, uh, the, the pier is a little bit more flexible, so then the deflection of the pier is a little concern. And here is the, uh, also it's a good idea to come up with a, a girder framing and erection plan, showing the erection sequence. Usually you want to start at the fixed bearing. In this case, it, this is the fixed, fixed pier. And you put the outside girders first. Work, and then first you want to go and stabilize the uh, outside girders. That requires minimum extending it over to two piers, fixed pier and the next expansion pier. And then from there on, you can start erecting the interior girders inward. Uh, and then this also shows the other one thing I guess to mention is that uh, you want to put all your uh, field splices 
outside the railroad uh, clearance envelope because the, you not you cannot put anything inside this clearance envelope, which is about 15 feet uh, either either side of the track. So by putting the splices outside, that uh, greatly simplifies the uh, erectors contractors uh, uh, task. So that's what was done here and these are the locations of the uh, temporary supports and going and usually in these curved girder, uh, plate girder bridges the expansion uh, bearings are oriented towards the fixed pier and this how it, and HA Lamar high, high load multi rotational pot bearing site utilized. And uh, due to the length of the bridge, also mod modular joint are required. And due to the radial component of the movement, uh, swivel type joints are usually used. And uh, I have a few minutes, I'll just quickly go through the uh, MIDAS civil uh, analysis. It, MIDAS civil program was used to investigate lateral response of the structure to investigate peer deflections, modular joint movements and lat lateral reactions at abutments. The, 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 the concern here is that since the piers are very flexible but abutments are relatively rigid, so the lateral forces will propagate towards the abutments and increase the uh, lateral reactions at abutments and, uh, and uh, perhaps the mod modular joint movements. And uh, basically model, uh, I'll just go to the initial model was developed using the the wizard composite bridge girder wiz, uh, wizard and this is now a, there are a lot of good uh, Midas uh, tutorials on this one so I'm just gonna go through that real quick I guess the only thing is that you it uh, Midas also has a capability to, for the uh, you can de uh, define the deck pouring sequence and you know how much uh, usually you want to pour the positive moment regions first and negative uh, moment regions uh, later so the, using Midas you can define the negative moment regions to, to be poured later at each pier so it's a good uh, nice uh, uh, capability and here is the uh, Midas civil model developed by Wizard. Basically, I did uh, develop this whole using the Wizard, and I added these additional elements, uh, and uh, and also these have soil springs uh, to model the drill shaft uh, substructure with soil springs. And here, one thing that I would like to point out is that Midas civil also have that. Uh, a thin section, open sec uh, uh, element here that has the warping uh, degree of freedom, seven degree of freedom. So when you def uh, define the girder element here, uh, click that consider warping effect box here. That way you will get a better representation of the warping stiffness of the system. And this is how the model looks. And uh, this is the influence line for the live load uh, for Pier 1. Here, and this uh, using the live load tracker, you can locate the location of the track that is, gives you the most critical reactions at that pier. And then using that location, actually what I did is that I input the uh, axle loads uh, as a static load case. This is for an HL93 load. As you see, due to curvature, the outside wheels have more 
reaction than inside curve, so you can accurately put the axle force, uh, the wheel reactions on the deck. And, uh, and also the, uh, the centrifugal forces are, you can input on, apply to the deck as a, a element or not static forces. You need to, to, to do a little calculation, but then you can apply these. And similarly, the, there is also a HL93 uh, uniform load. Uh, from the, you can tell that you have uniform load in span 1, span 2, and span 4. You can also put those as nodal loads. And then uh, bearing orientation, quickly you orient these bearings, you go into the uh, elastic uh, link menu and you, you can uh, change the beta angle here to, to whatever uh, direction you would like the apply. And then these are the stiffnesses of the bearings you can input for an accurate representation of the uh, bearings. And this is the, uh, the peer reactions without uh, soil structure interaction that was done with the original wizard model. And, and then the this is the peer displacements with with uh, using the complete model with the soil st uh, structure interaction considered, and here uh, we observed that uh, due to the stiffness, uh, the uh, the low stiffness, relatively low stiffness of the peers, the and the uh, the the deck is very rigid, so. Uh, a lot of the lateral movements are resisted by the abutments and thus uh, reducing the lateral movements at the piers. And here uh, modular joint movements. So the And uh, again, we did peer reactions with soil structure interaction. And lateral reactions at abutments due to temperature loading. So the significant amount of reactions are generated. And it, 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 as a summary and a discussion of results, the Complete model with the uh, soil structure interactions uh, considered, the, the lateral reactions due to live load effects were distributed to all supports. And this reduced the peer deformations approximately by a factor of two as compared to decoupled analysis using uh, tributary span, which is a more classical approach. You take the tributary span and then apply all the loads uh, independently for each peer, so that uh, the three-dimensional model showed that actually this is very conservative. There's a lot of the loss uh, propagate to more stiff abutments, and and uh, because of that reason, the lateral reactions at the abutments increase approximately 25 percent. And however, the joint movements were about the same as simple calculations based on expansion length. So that. And I put some references. These are the publications. They're very uh, useful information. I basically did had a very small amount of this uh, available information uh, covered in this presentation. With that, uh, I can take some questions. I'm I'm not sure how the time is, but. I'm assuming we have a few minutes. Great. Um, I'm making you organizer now, so you'll be able to see in your GoToMeeting um, menu the questions tab. But you, you still have uh, at least five minutes to, to take a look at some questions. Yeah. 
can I, can I, you see them I now? Click, do I question tab? Yes, uh, near the bottom there should be. Um, yeah. So just uh, open that up and there's, oh, okay. there's a couple okay. questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So please read the question out loud um, before answering. Okay. I can barely read it. Is there a way to expand this window? Oh. Reload method. Okay. The question is, did the designer compare the reload method to three-dimensional analysis? In one of my projects, the reload method did not produce conservative design, especially when, uh, especially when, uh, when the band cap flexibility is considered. Uh, no, we did not uh, consider the reload method because. Uh, at this uh, day and age, uh, you know, with uh, uh, programs like MIDAS and uh, MDX and many other programs uh, uh, available, uh, we use those. They uh, are shown, especially by the reference uh, this research report I uh, uh, you mentioned earlier that. Uh, these uh, grid, to the grid methods are much more superior to the reload method. Okay, did I answer the question or? Yes, um, you can proceed to the, the next questions. Okay. Okay, the part of that previous question was the, especially when the band cap flexibility is considered. Yes, yeah, um, the reload method will not consider any flexibility of the uh, substructure. In fact, uh, even the uh, plain grid, 2D grid methods will not consider that. That's, what, that, that's the main reason why we use MIDAS uh, and develop the 3D model that uh, that is the only way you can consider the band and column flexibilities and, the, the, and uh, in, even you can add the soil springs to consider the effect of the uh, soil. But none of those uh, other methods will uh, give you the capability to, to consider the uh, substructure stiffness. You need a three-dimensional model. Perhaps you can do it with a three-dimensional uh, frame model, but that that three-dimensional frame model may be using the warping degree of freedom, using that uh, thin walled open section element. With that, you could uh, probably get a, a reasonable uh, uh, response. Okay. The next question. I don't see the next question. Did I miss one? Okay, hold on. Okay. Okay. Do we need Do we need to calculate live load forces due to curvature manually? No. Uh, no, we don't. We do not need to uh, c calculate live load forces uh, due to curvature uh, in in a grid two D grid analysis with a V load. Yes. With the reload method, because with the reload you need to always ca calculate uh, those uh, fictitious uh, loads required for the system equilibrium. So when you put the live load, uh, it will change the uh, primary bending of the girders. So uh, to, for the equilibrium, you need to calculate the V-loads. But in uh, you, when a two D two D or 3D model is used, the interaction with, between the girders uh, is automatically calculated by the model. So the, the V-loads are already uh, calculated internally by the model and uh, the final moments are uh, basically the sum of the primary and the uh, 
uh, fictitious reloads uh, generated by the cross frames and diaphragms. So then you don't need to uh, consider that. The only thing you, you may have to consider uh, is that that uh, approximate uh, calculation of the warping normal stresses if your model does not have that warping degree of freedom that I uh, mentioned in one of the slides, that uh, without that, then you'll have to manually calculate the warping uh, normal stresses and add that to the uh, uh, stresses due to the vertical loads. Well, uh, well, I uh, thank you all. Thank you much for joining in. Um, are there still a few questions? Do you have a, another couple minutes? Sure. Yeah, I yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I think within the the same box, you should be able to see a few more. Oh, oh okay. I I I see that there was. I I apologize. I didn't okay. notice that. One question is that I'm not able to see anything. Did, did you did you have that message? One uh, one. Yeah, we can, arts, we, can we can move on from that one. Okay. Was Midas able to implement the Illinois 120 track as a design track, and how about the double track for peer reaction? <coughs> Yes, uh, uh, Maida Civil has uh, the ability to uh, define any, any the track configuration. Uh, basically, you can define the axle spacing and axle loads, and then you can use that as your design track. And the double track is the same. You can put uh, two, two uh, double double tracks uh, uh, as uh, Specified by Ashto, you would you would have to uh, that basically you would have to de define a double track using the same capability. Uh, for example, uh, for HL nine, the three you have three axles, uh, eight, uh, thirty-two, thirty-two keep axles for the double track. You would have to space to uh, put another three axles and put the uh, spacing. I believe it's uh, 50 feet between the first track and the second track, and then reduce the axle loads by uh, 0 0.9 to uh, simulate the ash to double track condition. And then you can have a moving load case using that track. Okay, next. Oh, that was from Arsalan. Uh, did you compare Midas results with MDX output? Uh, we did. The limited uh, comparison. Basically, we compared the uh, uh, girder reactions, and we get a we got a pretty good uh, correlation. And uh, however, one thing I uh, didn't uh, mention because uh, I went over the analysis parts quickly is that with the MDX uh, you, uh, model, you need to be careful because MDX LMS doesn't have the warping degree of freedom. So w when you model uh, the MDX uh, grid model, you want to use a coarse, coarse, coarse resolution model because if you do a, a fine resolution model, it puts, uh, it breaks the elements between cross frames, so you have more than one element between cross frames. When you do that, uh, then the warping stiffness of the uh, flanges is not modeled. So, th so then your uh, girders became too flexible in rotation uh, and uh, gives uh, erroneous results for deflections. So that the same thing applies to the plate and uh, parallel beam 
all uh, approach. You want to use, uh, but uh, I look at that. Actually, the mid 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 middle uh, uh, resolution also is good because only the fine resolution. I will not recommend uh, to use fine resolution for with those models. But uh, coarse or uh, middle resolution uh, is good because you don't want. You want the beam element going from one cross frame to the other cross frame. You don't want it more than one element between cross frames because of the warping uh, stiffness consideration. Another question: uh, Were the beams essentially modeled as the as line elements. Any issues with rigid links between slab beam line elements with cross frame? Y yes, uh, the basically uh, the curvature is, it, there are no curved elements, so the curved girder is uh, modeled as series of chord wise uh, straight elements, and uh, and there, I, I we didn't have any issues with uh, uh, rigid links between slab and beam elements uh, with respect to cross cross frame. Uh, I maybe I cross frame forces. Uh, um, Maybe I need a little bit clarification on the question. What kind of uh, issue is uh, referred to? Well, while we're waiting for additional information on that question, I'm going to move to the next question. It says, uh, uh, hi, hi, Victoria, and Victoria has this f question. I have a question about modeling. How do you consider the connection between pier and girder? Well, the connection between pier and girder is uh, considered uh, as an elastic link. I, I can go back to that. Uh, slide here, here is, it, you define an elec elastic link and, uh, and there is, in MIDAS you can define the height of that link, that should be about the same as your uh, bearing, and then uh, you can orient, if it's an expansion bearing, you can orient it, it uh, towards the fixed bearing, in this case we had it all oriented towards this pier. And then also, I don't have the, there are three more terms here. I, I just wanted to have a big picture here, so I eliminated those. But then you can input the, uh, the, the, the stiffness of the bearing here in, in, inside the elastic. So if it is a uh, sliding bearing, then it doesn't have any stiffness. So you put uh, zero. Sometimes putting zero causes a, uh, a problem with in the solution. So so there's a small number here. In this case, I put zero here, but uh, sometimes this causes some numerical instability. So a small number may work better if you have that kind of a situation. Okay, next question is pier and girder, are they fixed by the node? Um, I assume you're referring to the, 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 the bearing. Yeah, the bearing is fixed at the, uh, at the pier side, but it'll, it'll move on the girder side. Uh, that is controlled by the stiffnesses you uh, we input. So if, if you want it to move, then you put a small stiffness. That's what I did on a sliding bearing.
Well, we did not. Uh, we since we had a lot of uh, cases, we applied uh, uh, equivalent static loads uh, to the to the. The question is why increase the x live load nodal loading for curvature? Does the model account for the effects of curvature? Uh, because of the uh, centrifugal forces, the outside wheels. Uh, reactions are more than the inside wheel. So that, that's why we, uh, we, we input uh, bigger uh, to model the centrifugal effect on the truck uh, wheel reactions. And uh, that's how the model accounted for the uh, Centrifugal forces, but that's not all. Uh, that's the effect on the wheel reactions. In addition to that, you also apply a, a centrifugal force in the lateral direction uh, to for the uh, effect of the the mass of the truck because truck still is trying to move out and. There is a friction force in the lateral direction pushing the bridge out. So that also needs to be added as a centrifugal force in addition to the, 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 the truck uh, wheel reactions are that that's the normal distribution of the vertical uh, forces. But in addition to that, you also need to input the lateral uh, force. Another question, rigid link would force beam to have same curvature as deck causing high forces in cross frames since web flexibility is not is not modeled. Okay, yeah, that is true. Uh, the that uh, that is that's that makes the it makes yeah, there's some uh, that results in higher cross frame forces makes it a little bit uh, flexible. We did not study that because, as I mentioned, uh, we used uh, a, the grid model for the superstructure uh, design. We did not uh, use Midas, so I couldn't answer that question. So we did not look into that. We used Midas basically for the lateral response, total lateral response of the system, including the uh, stiffnesses of the piers and the uh, soil uh, springs. So I'm, I, I would have to get back to you on that one. Uh, we have not uh, studied that. Uh, we did not compare, did a very detailed comparison of the uh, to the two degree uh, model and uh, Midas uh, 3D model uh, in that regard, uh, with, with regard to the cross frame uh, reactions. Okay. Uh, next question is how to how do you calculate stiffness of bearing? Man, uh, yeah, that's a very uh, not that easy thing to do. The best thing is to contact the the bearing vendor. They usually if uh, and they will uh, provide you with with those stiffness values. It's not that uh, easy thing to do. I experienced that it's difficult to get that kind of information from them, but uh, uh, I, I, but some of them, some vendors do have, have that. They, they do not uh, uh, give that information in their catalogs, but if you, if you can call and find the right person, you, they'll, you can get that information from that. Uh, 
Okay, next question. Were there any stability analyses done for construction erection staging? Well, here in Illinois, we do not do that. The designers usually don't do that. Um, the, the, the only thing, and that's usually the responsibility of the, uh, the contractor. He needs to get a structural engineer and uh, ch check that um, and submit his calculations to the designer for review and acceptance. But that's how uh, it's set up here. I think the main reason why it's done that way is that <coughs> because uh, you, you know we do not know exactly how the contractor is going to uh, uh, you know erect the girders. So without that knowledge, it is very difficult to analyze for uh, stability uh, and erection staging. I mean, that's usually dictated by the contractor. You know what? But we did provide a, 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 some erect, erection sequence and uh, but for this, uh, the erection sequence we provided, uh, we are using uh, uh, supports so that uh, the erection stability is, with the temporary supports uh, is not a, a, an issue. If, if the contractor goes with a different erection sequence, then he's required to submit uh, uh, calculations and and one thing regarding the stability usually you 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 don't want the uh, the center of gravity of the girder and the uh, the cord connecting the two ends of the girder the distance between the center of gravity to that cord you want to keep it less than uh, three feet if it is more than that, that usually uh, creates some uh, uh, stability during uh, the lifting the girders as well as the transportation of the girders during the transportation. Okay, the, another question, it, it is not MIDAS account for centrifugal forces? As I understand, you consider that effect in your model for vertical force and applied lateral forces. The lateral forces is applied at what level of deck? as I know it creates problem in model analysis. Well, centrifugal forces are usually applied uh, six feet above the deck, but uh, you, know, you can get equivalent uh, force in a moment. And uh, you know, I applied it at deck, mo mo deck level uh, and uh, using the equivalent uh, force system. Basically, there's a, a, lat a lateral force and a t overturning moment. Is it just takes a little bit calculation. It's a six foot, so can you please post the link uh, where we get the PDF of this presentation? That is the uh, uh, final right. question. We, uh, I, we can take care of that, and I think that that is the the conclusion of the questions. So thank you very much, much again um, for 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 your presentation, and I think we can conclude it here. Okay. Thank you much. Thank you much. Have a good day. Uh, bye bye.